Okay. Well, with that time, I know a few folks will probably be joining us as we begin, but wanna wanna be able to keep us on schedule as much as possible. And so really excited to kick off this evening with the story, I Am Not Your Cholo, and the performance today of telling migration stories in persuasive essays. And so that is what we will be diving into. Um, first, really just want to quickly introduce myself. I am Misha. I am the program director from Reimagining Migration. And though our two fantastic counterparts at Worlds Without Border will be speaking shortly, I also want to give a really quick preview as to who they are. So I'm going to pass it over to them very quickly. Thank you so much, Misha. And thanks, everyone, for getting here. Um, many at the end of long school days. Um, so my name is Nadia Kelman, and I'm from Words Without Borders campus. And my name is Maggie Bleedstra, and I'm the Education Program Coordinator at Words Without Borders Campus. And thank you both for being my fantastic co-facilitators here, and you all are in for a fantastic treat with a little bit about their organization is they are coming to us from Words Without Borders, whose real purpose here is connecting classrooms to authentic global stories that are then translated into English. And so they will be the ones facilitating our story today, and it is especially just salient moment with our upcoming months of celebration and so really excited to have these fantastic experts in the room to guide us through the literature piece before we really dive into that i want to give us kind of an overview of what we will be discussing today so we are going to start with a little bit about reimagining migration why we are co-hosts here today and then diving into belonging and storytelling, really the purpose behind why we put on these webinars, why we are so moved by the opportunities of storytelling to build connectiveness and belonging, um, and then a little bit on why and how to tell these globally connected stories before we lead specifically into our story of highlight today, which is the I Am Not Your Cholo, and then we're going to dive into some resources and then hopefully end with a moment of Q&A. Um, really want to highlight first some of the devices that we are bringing to the front because we might have some ELA folks in the crowd is stories in nonfiction text and then also first person and third person point of view and how those can be tools for connection and belonging and persuasive storytelling. And so very quickly at a high level, why reimagining migration, why we're we here today. And so this is the guiding framework with which we're operating. It's first understanding who are the young people that we are educating? How should we be teaching about migration, which is coming into play in today's webinar, a little bit of how we tell stories that are maybe underrepresented in the global conversation around migration. Next, how do we create powerful learning environments for all students? And so that is kind of the second question that we'll really be touching on today is thinking about how we can build belonging and create powerful learning environments for all students by being able to tell our stories. Next being, what are the most important perspectives for a world on the move? And how do we prepare our educators for a changing world? Which is what we're all doing today, sitting in, witnessing, being engaged in telling these global stories. This is one way in which we are preparing educators for a changing world. And so thank you all for being here. Nadia said it early. I know that it has been perhaps a long first week back to school, or we are just getting prepared for being back into the swing of things within a full education cycle. But thank you again for sharing this evening with us and being a part of the educators who are preparing themselves. And so we're really, we're really grateful to have you all here. Now, first, I want to kick us off with some questions on belonging. So before we do all this diving into belonging, I want to start with question one and would love for folks to just be able to drop their answers into the chat and then we will hopefully discuss off my question two. But for the first question is, what does belonging look like? What does belonging feel like? What does belonging sound like? And I am actually in very Zoom school fashion, going to put two minutes on the clock to give folks a chance to either drop their answers in the chat or independently meditate for themselves of what does belonging look like, feel like, and sound like. And so I'm going to put two minutes on the clock starting now, and I will rejoin us momentarily. Oh, I love that. I'm um, like a warm, cozy coat that I'm not afraid to show off. 
because I'm a part of that community. I love that a lot. And I'm, I'm not going to pause to read everyone's here because I do want us to really be able to dive into that second question. But as we're engaging in what does belonging look like, feel like, sound like, I really want us to also think about the spaces that our young people are in. What are they seeing that signals to them, hey, I belong here. Maybe I'm a new fourth grader in a school. What do I hear that sounds like, oh, people like me are really excited to come here every day. People like me are going to be able to be, you know, in the play or on the team or invited over to the activity. What are some of those signals that are going to say, hey, you belong here? And so I really want us to keep this thought process of what does it look like, feel like, sound like, what things do you hear in the hallways that signify that there is a sense of belonging? especially for those of us who are perhaps on campuses with young people. Now, I really wanted to dive into question two, and I am also gonna give us just a minute to think about this question because I want us to be able to share out in the chat and have time for that, if we should so please, is what are the effects of not feeling like you belong? And so I'm gonna put another minute for us to just brainstorm a little. And then once that minute ends, I'll invite those to come off mic if they should be so interested, but really thinking, in the short term, in the long term, material effects, psychological, perhaps financial, like what are some of these effects of feeling like you belong? Of not, sorry, what are some of the effects of not feeling like you belong? And so going to just put one minute on the clock for us to reflect silently, and then I will ask those of us who wish to share to do so. So one minute starting now. Thank you for sharing as well. I know that these are not easy questions, especially when they're emotions that well up for a lot of us. And so honestly, I'd like everyone just to take a moment and look at the chat and see where some of these yeah, feelings are shared that at least, you know, in one space that there is community among people who have felt similarly and want to build a world where no one feels that way, one, but especially the young people that we are, you know, in charge of, that we're building places where they don't have those questions about themselves. And so I just want to take a, a moment to pause here and say thank you all. I know that experiences of belonging, one of the effects is they really do, as we will see in this next excerpt, lead into so much of what our day-to-days look like and what our future planning looks like. I'm going to take a moment to to read this short excerpt for you all, definitely feeling very much so like I'm back in my my Zoom school days. But as in reading this, I want us to think about some of the words that are bolded here. What are words that you might have bolded and how did this align with your thoughts on ways in which feelings of not belonging or not feeling like one belongs can potentially impact all of one's life. And so I'm about to read this excerpt really shortly. Just letting a few people in. Okay, thank you. And again, as I'm reading this, I want us to think about perhaps this aspect of belonging, what it looks like, feels like, and sound likes, and then some of these long-term effects of not feeling like you belong. And so this is an excerpt from the story we're about to dive into. Um, and it starts, it is strange to grow up thinking that some things aren't meant for you, that they are not suitable, or that you don't deserve them. Stranger still to realize that you've spent your whole life telling yourself the same thing. This job isn't meant for you. That girl isn't meant for you. The voice never lets up. It's there even now that you live in the United States, reminding you that for many, your skin and your origin are your disadvantage. And so this is just a short excerpt from the story that we are about to dive into. And I just want, yes, want to preface that this is an example of one of those long-term moments, the questioning about what next step, what opportunities are available for you if you are going to be a leader in your spaces. And they can start to ring through. But again, it's a reminder that for many, and this is an outside response, and it is something, your skin, your origin, those are things that are about yourself that ideally you'd be able to cherish and bring with you and share with others with so much joy and glory and excitement to tell your story. Um, but then you have these moments where when there are moments of a lack of belonging, that is not the case. And so belonging is this word that we're throwing around. I know we've all had personal relationships with it, but we want to take a moment and pause and say, what is belonging? And so through this research brief that we've put together in collaboration with History Clo Lab, we asked the question, what is belonging? And what we found overwhelming is to belong is to be embraced. It is a feeling of safety, support, 
celebration and civic agency within a community. And it's that civic agency piece that is often left out of the broader conversation. It's this opportunity to say, hey, these are things that I really like that I want to see more of in the community, or this is something that I need to change for people like me to thrive. And so that opportunity to be, you know, to, to go to the community forum, to have your voice heard and listened to, and to be a part of these things that make community so powerful. And so with that, we're thinking about what does that look like for young people in our communities? And we know that promoting belonging leads to psychological well-being, it's academic success, it is reducing prejudice, it's social cohesion and a reduction of fights or clashes. It promotes inclusion and belonging. It supports identity development and mental health. And so when all young people feel like they belong, we're really getting these environments where the goals of why we have students going to school and learning and building their identities and feeling really proud of themselves, that's when it's able to happen. It's when they feel safe, seen, and celebrated. But this does not just happen. It is a direct result of deliberate policies and practices aimed at fostering inclusive environments. And one of those practices is being able to tell one story with joy and to have it received and celebrated and uplifted by their community. And so that is why I am so excited to be able to pass this off to our counterparts at Words Without Border who are doing this fantastic work of telling stories and making people feel seen and celebrated. And so with that, I will be stopping my screen share and passing it off to I love you, Nadia. Thanks so much, Misha. And thanks to everyone who um, was part of that conversation, which went deeper than I expected. And um, yeah, it, it was really nice to hear from you. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Words Without Borders and what we do, um, and then we're going to go right into a story. Um, so Words Without Borders publishes literature from all over the world um, bilingually whenever we, we can get those rights, um, and often with audio files of author readings and things like that, um, and we make it available for free online. And um, publish it with a lot of resources to affirm the cultures that students bring to their schools and also help students learn about one another. Um, so, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about why these stories matter, um, although that's a little bit preaching to the choir, so I hope that people really jump into that part of the conversation. Then we're going to look at the essay Misha mentioned, I Am Not Your Cholo, we're going to look at a very interesting story that he tells within it. And um, three, we're probably not going to get to um, unless we really surprise ourselves and speed through the rest of this. Um, but we're going to give out the link to this PowerPoint. And in that, you'll see a bunch of suggestions for other free uh, global readings that you can access and also ways to find uh, still more of them. Okay, so I, like I said, I would love it if you all participated and, and shared your thoughts as we go through this first part. Um, why read voices from other parts of the world? So I'm going to play a video for you. You see that there's a quote up here in this PowerPoint, um, but I'm going to be looking very closely at the chat um, and by the way, that's also where my colleague Maggie will be uh, hanging out and responding to everyone um, as, as you contribute your ideas. So you're going to be hearing from a student. Um, we have this program where we bring in authors to write um, along with students in their heritage languages. Um, so this year it was um, the author of the essay that we're about to read from, Marco Aviles, um, who was brought to several schools. He led writing workshops in Spanish. Um, the school that we're about to go to now um, had a lot of Spanish speaking students, but they didn't necessarily always feel comfortable sharing that part of themselves in school. So that's the context. Um, and now I will share it and replay the video. Oh. Something that stood out to me about today's visit was like the way he got like 
he didn't talk about like the topics we were talking about in class he was talking more about like his personal life which really helped um give me an idea of who he was as a person and like the type of things he stands for and like the the type of environment he grew up around and like i feel like i could really see myself in him because i obviously grew around a hispanic household similar to him so that's something i could really relate to Um, and then to the right, it's a student who was working with another one of these authors we brought. Um, this was um, a Chinese-speaking uh, author and translator, and this was the year that COVID hit. So there, there was a lot of um, there, there was a lot of unhelpful language flying around, uh, especially around Asian people, and so um, this really meant a lot um, when the student responded in this way to him coming. And then the other thing that happens is that students also are just innately curious about finding out about their global peers all over the world and how people live. Um, and so we had a teacher in New York who was teaching um, English um, to speakers of other languages, um, but they were mostly Spanish speakers, and she was teaching House on Mango Street, which of course a lot of people teach. Um, but she also brought in a story from Russia, and the students were really, really engaged by it because it dealt with similar themes um, to to ones that they experienced in their own lives. But it also opened a window on an on a different part of the world that they hadn't really thought about. Um, so yes, as Maggie says, if you share your thoughts or maybe some experiences that you've previously had in bringing literature from other parts of the world or, or from diverse authors to your students, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Um, so the essay that I wanted to share with you um, is by Marco Viles, the author we previously mentioned. It's available bilingually on our site, um, and it is a story about migration, um, but also much more than that. It's a story about language. He brings in um, the civil rights movement in the US in the 1960s. He weaves a lot of different things together, and the way that he does that is through storytelling. Um, so I know for myself, when I was taught how to write essays in school, it was a sort of dry process. You had like five paragraphs and you had something you had to prove, persuade your reader of something, and then you tried to prove it with different details. But he uses stories. And I think that this is a really, really good model for showing students how um, exciting nonfiction writing can be. So to get into the story, we're going to start with one piece of it the, the same way that he begins it. And it's an immigration story that is not the usual one that we hear. Um, and the picture you see is from social media. And I want you to just think about what you might be seeing here. Um, what, what kind of immigration story is this? What might be happening? And I can give you a clue that the story takes place outside the US. So think about it for like, I don't know, 10 seconds. Um, take another look at the picture. And then I'm going to be asking for two readers. We have um, some, like a long paragraph each for Spanish and for English. Um, because as I said, this essay is available bilingually. So if you are willing to read aloud in either Spanish or English, put that in the chat. Oh, thank you, Leah. That is great. Um, and now we just need a, <coughs> me, a volunteer uh, for the English. For sure, Bess. Oh, thank you very much, Fred. So I think we'll start with the Spanish so that we can hear how it sounds in the original language. And then we'll go to the English um, whenever uh, Fred is ready. 
Okay, so I'm going to mute myself and we'll listen to these two readings. Okay. Una pareja estadounidense se mudó a Lima y abrió un restaurante de hamburguesas en uno de los corazones culinarios de la ciudad. La competencia es dura y los esposos Justin y Brandy Willy parecen bastante optimistas. Su local se llama Papi Carne y en sus redes sociales escriben en inglés ¿Qué hacen dos gringos ofreciendo hamburguesas en la meca de la cocina latinoamericana? Un domingo por la mañana, ella cogió el diario para acompañar el desayuno y, oh my God, el crítico culinario les había dedicado una reseña. Thank you. That was beautiful to hear that in Spanish. Uh, an American couple relocated to Lima and opened a hamburger joint in one of the city's culinary hotspots. The competition is stiff, but Justin and Brandy Wiley seem pretty optimistic. Their restaurants is called Papi Carne, and they write in English on their social media profiles. What are two gringos doing serving up hamburgers in the mecca of Latin American cuisine? One Sunday morning, Brandy picked up the newspaper at breakfast, and oh my God, it's food critic had devoted a review to them. Thank you so much to both our readers. Thank you, Tia. Thank you, Fred. Um, so what do you think? Why do you think US students might be surprised about this story? What's surprising about it? What's different than what we usually see in stories about immigration? And you can um, unmute yourself also. Yes, Leah, stories of American people moving to, Le to Lima. They are transplants, not the other way around. Um, yes, and in fact, as Aviles points out in this essay, which is also about his own um, immigration to the US, migration is human. And the biggest um, supplier of immigrants to Peru is the United States. Um, and it often happens, just as he's described it in this essay, they come as tourists and they they want to stay, they fall in love with it. Um, yeah, and it's sort of reversing the roles, but it's different for the Wiley than it is for many immigrants here. And I think that looking at those differences is illuminating because it gives us a sense of what the possibilities might be. Um, it doesn't have to be the way that it too often is here. So the Wiley's immigrant experience um, is that they very quickly got a visa, they felt welcomed, and they, they had basically unrestricted work opportunities. Um, these flags are, I think, from their restaurant on um, Fiesta Patrias Peru the uh, national holiday there. Um, so they felt like they could very easily integrate into the society. And in fact, Aviles mentions that they're not even called immigrants. Um, they're called gringos, um, but they're not called immigrants. And he says that that word may now, even though it seems neutral, have this connotation. Um, so that's that's just an interesting conversation that maybe older students could have. Um, and this leads into thinking about what could help people feel welcome? What could we learn from this story about how Peru welcomes immigrants? And we're going to go over to Misha and look at what we might gain from a comparison between these two parts of the world and how they treat newcomers. Um, but first, I wanted to say that if you're interested in stories and conversations like this one, um, you can subscribe to a monthly newsletter where you get the uh, new ones emailed to you. And I also wanted to share a folder of just information about our organization if you'd like to get more involved. Um, so with that all said, let me pass it back to Misha. Thank you so much. And make sure that you are checking the chat for those to be dropped as I am sharing the screen. All 
Okay. And again, just take a moment to check the chat for the resources that they are dropping. And so I really want us to pause for a moment and think about what is the same about this story and other immigrant stories that we have heard or been told? Uh, what is different about the Wiley's experience? And then perhaps what do we gain by comparing these stories? And so with the time that we have left, would love to give people or folks about two minutes just to think about these questions. Um, I know I love sitting in a little bit of silent time before we share out. So going to give folks about two minutes and then we'd love to have, have an open conversation. What is the same about this story? What is different? And what do we gain? And really thinking about ourselves as perhaps educators and community members. What do we gain by comparing these stories? And so I'm going to put two minutes on the clock just for us to collect our thoughts. And I want to thank you all for sharing and the insight that we brought and what we're really getting out of this last piece of what do we gain by comparing. And so even in that, we're having a conversation around belonging, who belongs, who doesn't, especially I really encourage you to go to Words Without Border site and read this story in full if you haven't. And you really start to see how some of these differences play out is who receives what names, who is welcomed, and perhaps that piece that we had way earlier in the beginning of those feelings of belonging, I think perhaps there is that inverse piece of what happens when you feel like you have belonged your whole life, when you maybe have that confidence on, or perhaps, you know, then to go for the job, to acquire the resources, to then feel like you can go anywhere in the world and make a home for yourself, how those are, you know, some of the benefits you feel from that grounded sense of belonging. And so then we think about the reverse and how that has lasting impacts. And so that is just one of the things that we gain by comparing. And so that is why I wanna bring us to the framework that is also, sorry, the learning arc that is also a Project Zero and Veronica Boisbuncia collaboration, which kind of gets us to what we do with these stories. And so first, right, we start with this understanding of moving stories of like the story that we just heard Every single person has a migration story. We, none of us just magically appeared on this planet. We have all come from somewhere. And so what is yours? What is mine? How we can use this understanding of migration stories to one, really know our history to the best that we have access to, because again, all migration stories are very different. Some were, as this family, go into Peru for opportunities. Others were forced and others were done out of necessity, right? So everyone has a different story and a different relationship to their story, but everyone has one. And that is one of the starting ports of conversation that we can do with young people. Next then is really understanding migration, which again, these stories and the resources on Words Without Border site are fantastic to get us starting to understand what was life like before migration? What was their journey like? What is their adjustment experience? It's going to be very different depending on what that next place is. For example, this, uh, this couple's relationship in Peru is going to be a very different adjustment experience than perhaps if it was reversed. If the people who they were welcoming them perhaps had moved to their town before leaving, what would that have looked like? And so just really understanding those stories and really that it isn't a monolith. There isn't one version of a migration story and everyone's own is worth being told, heard, and celebrated because then it allows us to get to this final piece in the learning arc, which is turning to action. So what would it mean then to think about the ways in which these experiences are different? How can we as young people understand the differences and the perhaps inequities in migration stories and use that as a way to build further belonging. Say, oh, I'm noticing here that in this story, someone is voicing that they have not felt like they have belonged in my community. What can I do to make them feel included? How can I make an action step to invite someone in to perhaps try their cuisine, to just have this share and exchange? How can I take my understanding of comparing different stories and turn that into an action to make society more inclusive and more sustainable? And so that is where I just want to pause in terms of how we can go from writing to taking action. And this is one of Words Without Borders slides, but really thinking about how you can do something to welcome newcomers in our classes, our schools, or our communities. And perhaps it is translations into heritage languages or performing in heritage languages and thinking about the welcoming words that we use. And so 
we could have students engage in these stories themselves, perhaps lead them themselves. And again, there's a plethora of resources on the Words Without Borders site. And so I just want to give us all a chance to make sure that we're checking that in the chat and we will follow up with those resources next, but really thinking about how we can take writing and transition it into action, maybe having students tell their own stories in class or to write up their version of belonging and share it with their peers or just little things that we can do to integrate a love of literature and a love for our students. Another resource that we have that we'd love to highlight is our culturally responsive teaching checklist. We also have an understanding migration curriculum checklist and reflection tool, and we are piloting a literary analysis guide. And so we would love to have feedback on that. Um, it is, you know, there is not one way to teach literature and the goal being that it can be as open and expansive as possible, but we are always looking for teachers to pilot and support in that work. So that should be live hopefully very soon and ready for the start of the school year. But again, it is very much so in, in pilot and working form and I'll always love to have, have more feedback and more eyes on what is useful for you all. Um, there's also more migration stories and poems. I have them up here and I'm sure they're being put in the chat such they will be in all follow-up communication that we have to send out to you all um, of different stories, diff more migration stories and poems you could perhaps use in your class and with your students. And again, there's an expansive uh, list of resources on the Words Without Borders website. And we actually have time to do a little bit of a tutorial on how to find those, but we're gonna come back to that at the end because we really want to have a moment to engage and think about why this conversation today is important to me. Well, that be you. Why is this conversation important to you, your students, and the world? And if you're not a teacher with students, you can also think about just the young people that you know, that you engage with, um, or that you you know you see going into schools, and your community members. So why is this conversation important to you, your students, and the world? And I would love to put on a clock for about five minutes for folks to either think answer in the chat or dive into conversation immediately. Um, this is going to kind of be a bit of a choose your own adventure, but I'm going to put five minutes on the clock for us to, to, to think about this, to, to go into a chat, um, anything that we want. So I'm going to put five minutes starting now. Um, actually, well, with that time we have left, I'll give everyone a chance to just skim, skim in the chat because I would love to, in the remaining time we have, allow for Nadia and Maggie to give us a little bit of a walkthrough on how to navigate their site, just so that way you have all the resources that you might need to directly bring these stories to your classroom. And so I will actually, Nadia, if you want, I can stop sharing and pass it back over to you, if that feels good. Okay, so um, here, it say that this, this essay doesn't seem quite right for your students. Um, you, it's really long for one thing. You can take little sections of it out. It's very quotable, but if you want more, maybe someone wants to teach like a whole migration unit. So I pulled together some other stories that are really good about migration. I'm not going to go through them all, but I just wanted to have their titles for you. And I think Maggie can copy into the chat. Um, some other ways that you can uh, pull up lists of stories like bilingual Spanish and etc. Um, and I will just say that Parapicha Mother is a very inspiring poem um, about an immigrant woman from Mexico who seems like just an ordinary person but is actually extraordinary and I think we have a lot of people like that in our lives um, so it can be a good starting point for for a conversation about that. And then the park bench is the story that I mentioned about the boy from Taiwan in Paris. Um, and if you go to our slideshow, you can click on any of these links and go directly to those stories. Um, so I wanted to tell you about how to find different stories for your students on our website. Um, one way is to use our find page, and that way you look through seven really deep country collections. But we also, besides those seven countries, we have about 50 other ones on our blog, um, also posted with a bunch of resources, um, including our newest collection, which is almost now completed of literature from the Caribbean. Um, and you can also do a search of the whole site um, if you wanna see everything at once. So this is what our find page looks like. This is where the seven country collections are. 
um, you can go directly to any country or you can use the filters um, to look for a genre, to look for a theme, um, or to look for reading grade level. So if you have, for instance, students who are learning English, um, who may be in high school but aren't yet reading at a high school level, you will find here stories that are definitely not for babies that have like very sophisticated ideas going on, but that have been translated into a language that is really accessible. Um, and here, just to show you an example of what it looks like to share our resources. Um, so we have a poem from Mexico called Speakless Homeland on the left. And then on the right, we have a lot of different things like you can learn more about the author from a video that we put together. You can meet the translator. You can read the poem in the original. You can get more ideas like more literature from that poet, et cetera, in the playlist. And then we also have teaching ideas that are um, matched with uh, common core standards for ELA um, and like discussion ideas and assignment prompts and things like that. Uh, and I, oh, and I just wanted to show you what the blog looks like. So here's something we recently posted from Haiti. It's a poet who is also a rapper and inspired by rap music. So it's easy to get into, um, but it, it brings up a lot of interesting classroom conversations. This home for children with trouble sleeping, not really for children. Um, so that's about all I had to show you from the site. Um, are there any questions or any things that come to mind uh, for people now?